UFC 287 this weekend from Miami, Florida. In the main event, it is the rematch of the middleweight championship fight between Alex Pereira and Israel Adesanya. It is their fourth fight in all of combat sports. It is their second one, though, in MMA. In the co-main event, you've got Gilbert Burns taking on Jorge Masvidal. I mean, we can talk about that fight later. I'm honestly not too excited because I think the result of that fight is pretty obvious, but 13 fights coming up from Miami this Saturday night for the UFC. And folks, if you have not yet, though, make sure that subscribe button down below for some more UFC here on the channel. Tomorrow, we will be posting our PFL number two predictions, so make sure to check out that video tomorrow. And again, make sure that subscribe button down below for more MMA here on the channel. And our first fight will be in the strawweight division. We have got Sam Hughes taking on Jacqueline Amorim. Um, in this fight, Sam Hughes comes into this one with a record of seven wins and five losses. Of course, two and four in the UFC. And for Sam Hughes, it, it's been a mixed bag. Her last, her last fight is a loss to uh, Piero Rodriguez. She loses by unanim unanimous decision. It's a fight where... Hughes just doesn't look great in that fight. She gets taken down five times. That's on the Grasso Arujo card. Um, she loses two rounds to one in that fight, but she was on a two-fight winning streak before that. Rodriguez lost. Winning back-to-back -back fights against Estela Nunez by majority decision, then finishing Elise Reed on that home Vieira card in May of 2022. Before those two fights, though, three-fight losing streak to start her, her UFC career. She was supposed to lose to Tisha Torres at short notice. She lose to Luma Lukboni by unanimous decision and then lose to Luana Pinheiro by unanimous decision as well. She will get her opponent though in Jacqueline Amorim in this fight for and for Amorim. I've seen her fight in LFA before. She's good. Really good submission game at Amorim. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. She's won uh four, she went 4-0 in LFA. She um five submission wins, one knockout win in her entire career, six and zero again. Four of the win, four of those wins though coming in the LFA. Two, her last two fights have been by knee bar finish. You know, look at her first fight in LFA. Rene could choke finish in 33 seconds. She gets a TKO finish in 10 seconds in her second fight. Then a knee bar in 90, or sorry, in 86 seconds. And then an arm bar finish at the end of the first round. Amorim goes out, goes out there and she gets finishes. She is the reigning LFA strawweight champion, winning that fight against Ashley Nichols in her last fight again by arm bar in the first round. Amorim is good, and I really don't see how Sam Hughes is going to get out this fight. We've seen Hughes get taken down a lot in the past. She's got a 47% takedown average or defense rate in the UFC, which isn't horrible, but it's not great by any stretch of the imagination. If Amorim is able to take her down, Amorim is going to submit her. So I think that's exactly what's going to happen here. I don't feel great about the ground game of Sam Hughes in the first place, and especially against Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt and Amorim and a fighter who has been really good on the ground in her entire career. I mean, she has not seen any danger just yet. She, again, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, LFA strawweight champion. She is a very good fighter, and she's going to go in there, and she's going to dominate Sam Hughes on the ground. I think it's going to be a submission in the first round. I think it'll be takedown submission right away. She's going to take the back and she's going to pick up a rear naked choke finish win over Sam Hughes. So give me Jacqueline Amorim to win her UFC debut in her first fight, beating Sam Hughes by first round submission. And our second fight is Shaila Nordenbeka taking on Steve Garcia for Shaila Nordenbeka. I mean, this is a guy who's looking for his 40th win in professional fighting this Saturday. This will be the man's 50th fight. Shaila Nordenbeka and, and, Get this, this is the crazy part. In only seven years, in under seven years, this man will have 50 professional fights. This guy was so active over in China, he would fight all the damn time. It's crazy. It is crazy the, you know, the 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 activeness that Shaila Nordenbeka has been able to put on. And since getting the UFC, the man is three and one. I've been high on Nordenbeka for a while now. I mean, he comes in, he loses to uh, Joshua Kaliba in his first fight, loses by unanimous decision. Beats Sean Soriano, though, after that by unanimous decision. Beats TJ Brown for that by unanimous decision. And then finishes Derek Minner in his last fight by knockout of the first round. Now, given that it's a fight that it was weird because Norton Becca was like a minus 200 favorite all week. But the, and then at the very last second, Norton Becca jumps from minus 200 to like minus 400. And it was that whole weird thing with James Crouch because James Crouch is Derek Minner's coach. And it was really weird. Minner, and then of course, Minner comes out there and he just, he doesn't, he looks like crap. So. Norton Becker wins by first round knockout. He'll get Steve Garcia in this fight. And for Garcia, 13-5. and five, um, Coming off a win in his last fight over Chase Hooper. He does what he's supposed to do to Hooper. Finishes him in the first round. Knocks down Hooper three times in the span of 90, 90 seconds. Lost to uh, Mahashet before that. Got knocked down in the first round. Beat Charlie Ontiveros. Again, did what he's supposed to do to Charlie Ontiveros. Lose to Violent Bob Ross, uh, Luis Pena. And then wins in the Contender Series before that. Um, 
I mean, for Garcia, he's going to have to try to strike with Norton Becca here, but Norton Becca has got power as well. And Steve Garcia has been cracked before as well. Before uh, as well, I mean, you look at the Charlie Ontiveros fight. Ontiveros isn't very good, but Ontiveros cracked Garcia twice. Now, Garcia still goes on to win the fight, but still, Mahashet cracked him twice in the span of a minute before Mahashet puts him away. Like, you're going to see a stand up war here, but Shaila Norton Becca has got a lot of power. Norton Becca can finish you. He's got 19 finishes so far in his professional career. And get this, the man's only 28 years old. For Steve Garcia, again, he's got power as well. But I feel like it's going to take him a little a little bit more time to finish Norton Becca than what it's going to take Norton Becca to finish him. Norton Becca's got pop in his in his fists, and I think it's just going to be tough all around for Steve Garcia in this fight. Norton Becca is a very physically strong fighter. Again, this guy's got so much experience. This is going to be his 50th professional fight against Garcia, a guy who's going to be walking in to his 19th professional fight, which is not bad by any stretch of the imagination. But still, it just shows you the activity that Shailan Norton Becca has, has been able to put through. And I think in his 50th professional fight, Shailan Norton Becca is going to go out there, and I think he's going to get a finish. I think Shailon Nurnabeka continues his streak of picking up first round knockouts. If Mahashet was able to put away Steve Garcia in the first round, I think Shailon Nurnabeka is able to do the same. So it could be Shailon Nurnabeka to finish Steve Garcia. He's going to get it done by first round knockout. Clash of Styles now in our next one. It will be a catchweight fight of 160 pounds. We've got Ignacio Bahamondes taking on Trey Ogden. For Ogden, he was scheduled just a couple weeks ago against Manuel Torres, or sorry, Manuel Torres. Uh, Torres could not make it to the octagon so Ogden didn't get the fight a couple weeks ago in the apex now he gets the spot in Miami Florida against Ignacio Bahamondes but again it is a clash of styles in this fight it is a hundred percent a clash of styles Trey Ogden is going to have to wrestle Ignacio Bahamondes I can talk about his two fights in the UFC but it is what it is we're going to talk about this from a fight perspective Ogden is going to have to take down Bahamondes if he's going to win this fight now Ogden, 15% takedown accuracy so far in the UFC. is fighting against Daniel uh, Zell Huber. He goes one for nine in his takedowns. The Monkey King fighting against Jordan Levitt. He goes one for four, right? It, it, you know, Levitt is, or sorry, not Levitt. Ogden's going to have to get that takedown tonight or on Saturday because Bahamondes is a very good striker. And now Bahamondes' grappling is getting better too. You look at his win over Rong Zhu. He goes in there and he submits Rong Zhu in the third round with a Bravo choke. Um, who, by the way, Rong Zhu, no longer in the UFC. You know, only one in two. 23 years old they got rid of him which i thought was really weird now now fighting in uae warriors i didn't really like that decision with with rongju but it's fine um for baja mondes two and one so far in the ufc his first fight in the promotion loses to john uh, mcdessey which is the fight that i did not think he was going to lose but it was a back and forth war on the feet victory hall and it was that card on, on a card on abc mcdessey does enough to pick up the victory over baja mondes baja mondes though comes back knocks out roosevelt roberts it was a fight that he was on his way to win he was on his way to win by decision but then the last second i mean ignacio baja mondes pulls out the spinning wheel kick knocks out roosevelt roberts it's crazy and then, of course, the Rong Zhu fight. It's a fight that he's on his way to win. He's going to beat Rong Zhu. He's going to beat him by not, or by decision. Eventually, though, he gets him in the Bravo choke, and he finishes him in the third round. That's why I think this fight's just so tough for Trey Ogden. Because, yeah, okay, Ogden will have the advantage on the ground. Ogden, if he takes down Bahamondes, will have a very will have a very good advantage down there. I think he's going to be able to go out there and get the and not get the finish, but I think he'll be able to beat him by decision if he's able to ground Bahamondes and keep him down there. But if Bahamondes is able to keep the fight on the feet, and if Bahamondes at least... If, if he's switching it up, if he's using his kicks, he's using his, his punches, I mean, it's just going to be a tough stylistic matchup for Ogden. And again, Ogden is going to have to, have to take down Bahamondes to win this fight, because if not, Ignacio Bahamondes is going to knock him out. That's just how this fight is going to go, right? And I don't think Ogden's able to get the takedown. I don't think Ogden's able to, to you know, find a way to get Bahamondes down. And I just think that everything points in this fight to an Ignacio Bahamondes knockout victory. I think it's going to be, it'll, it might be, a, you know, a highlight reel knockout because Ogden is just not the best guy in the feet. Yes, again, in the Zell Huber fight, he's able to outstrike Zell Huber, but there's a big difference between boxing and striking Daniel Zell Huber and kickboxing with a guy like Ignacio Bahamondes, who's got the power, who's got the flashy style that you saw in the Roosevelt Roberts fight. It's going to be tough. Give me, give me the minus 290 favorite, Ignacio Bahamondes. He's going to go out there, pick up a quick first round knockout victory over Trey Ogden. So Cindy Calvillo is back at 115 pounds, and she's going to be she's going to be fighting Lupita Gondinas in this fight. I just don't think this is good for Calvillo. This is a fighter who's lost her last four fights. Her last win comes in a main event spot against Jessica I back in 2020. It was that weird, you know, phase the apex. We were looking for main events, and they put Calvillo versus I on that card. Calvillo wins, but again, she has not won a fight since. She goes in there, she loses to Kaylin Kukchagian. It was a fight if Calvillo won, they're likely giving her a title shot. She loses, though. 
fights Jessica Andrade in a pay-per-view, another fight where if she wins, likely giving her a title shot. She loses. She gets Andrea Lee. She quits the school the stool. Lee absolutely schools her. And then they give her Nina Nunez in her last fight in San Diego. And Nina Nunez goes in there and barely beats her by split decision. Now, it was a closer fight. Calvillo was able to land on some takedowns. She wasn't able to keep Nina Nunez down. But now we get Calvillo versus Lupita Godinez. And... For Godinez. Now, I did not think she was going to lose Angela Hill. I did not anticipate that happening. That was on the same card where Calvillo lost to Nina Nunez. That was in San Diego. It was in August of 2022. So that's been a minute for Godinez. But now she's back. Um, you know, she was on two fight winning streak before that, beating the likes of Loma Luke Bonny and Ariane Conorlosi before that, both of them by unanimous decision. And you know what Godinez is going to do in there. If Godinez is on, she's going to take you down. She's going to slam you. She's going to pick you up and she's going to wrestle you. Now, Calvillo, a wrestler in her own right, is not bad at stuffing takedowns. Now, she has struggled in the past by, she's she struggled in getting takedowns herself, but in terms of stuffing takedowns, she's not horrible. And I think that's where this fight does get a little bit interesting. Because again, I don't think Calvillo's all that great at this point of her career. She's obviously a big underdog in this fight for good reason. She's, you know, Godina is almost three to one now um, in the odds. But I think it is interesting to the point where, okay, if Calvillo is able to keep this fight standing, then it just adds a new element to this fight, adds the striking element to this. But again, Calvillo is not the best striker in her own right. And I think, again, Cardo, or not Cardo, Lizzie, Godinez is not a great striker either. But I think even then, I think Godinez is, stri is slightly better striking wise than Cynthia Calvillo. Now, I don't think that's going to completely happen to the point where Godinez is forced to strike with uh, Calvillo, because I think there's going to be a point in time where she's able to get a takedown, and she's able to ground Cynthia Calvillo. It could be for the entire fight, it could be for a round, it could be for two rounds, but it's going to be a, there's going to be a point in this fight where that happens, right? So, you know, I think mean, Godinez at least wins one round on the ground. I think other than that, I think Godinez is able to strike Calvillo. I think she's able to outstrike Cynthia Calvillo. And I think Lupi de Godinez is going to win this fight. Again, I just don't see it with, with Cynthia Calvillo anymore. I think she's kind of washed. You know, she's 9-5-1 and one now. She's lost her last four. It feels like this is the fight they're going to put her away with a Lupita Godinez victory. And if Cynthia Calvillo is going to keep fighting, she'll probably go to Bellator, but we'll see. Give me Lupita Godinez to win this fight. I think she'll get it done by unanimous decision. Next up, we got Jerome Mearshart taking on Joe Pfeiffer. Um, this is interesting because, you know, Jerome Mearshart, I mean, the career resurgence continues with Jerome Mearshart. He finishes Bruno Silva in his last fight, and Bruno Silva was a guy that was running through dudes. He goes three, the full three with Alex Pereira, who's now the world champion, and Jeremy Richard goes in there and submits him in the third round. Sorry, my water bottle just cracked, but it's just... It's it's pretty crazy because Mearshart drops Bruno Silva in that fight. He looks really good in that win, and now he loses his fight before that, and it's a lost Kristoff Jotko, and I swear, the PFL... I don't know what they do to former UFC fighters, but most of them cannot win over there. Christoph Jocko loses to Will, F Will Flurry in his last fight. Um, I mean, you look at the guys, and I'll quickly talk about the PFL card. You look at the former UFC fighters on that card, all of them lose except for Impa Kasanganai. Kasanganai is the only one that wins, and of course, Kasanganai is not even in the season, apparently, but Kasanganai wins. Um, Daniel Torres loses. Uh, Jesus Pinedo loses. Uh, Chris Wade's been a PFL guy, but Christoph Jotko loses, Thiago Santos loses, and Marlon Moraes loses. So four UFC fighters go one in six on that card. It is crazy. Anyways, Jotko beats Jared Mearshart, but can't win in the PFL. Of course, he went on to lose to Brennan Allen after that. But anyways, back to specifically Jared Mir Gerald Mearshart, because it's weird because that Jotko loss is just in between a bunch of these good wins, the Bartos, Bartos Fabinski finish, the Mahmoud Muradov finish, the Dustin Stulfsis finish, he loses to Jotko and then beats Bruno Silva. Um, he was booked against Abus Magomedov, fight never went. Um, but for Jeremy Mearshart, again, tremendous ground game. He's always able to find a submission. And if you are Joe Pfeiffer in this fight, you have to stay out the ground game because that's where Gerald Mearshart's going to want to take him. And of course, Joe Pfeiffer is a guy that Dana White, you know, made that little tr that statement after he knocked out Ozzy Diaz on the Contender Series when he was the only finish on the entire card, even though Anton Turkulaj ended up getting a UFC contract anyway. But anyways, Joe Pfeiffer, the whole statement was, be like Joe Pfeiffer, and Pfeiffer, be like him. And of course, they, they gave him the layup by having him fight Alan Amadovsky in his first fight in the UFC. Amadovsky was horrible in the promotion, but Pfeiffer went in there and knocked him out in the first round. And now you get Joe Pfeiffer and Ger Gerald Mearshart. Mearshart's a tough guy to finish, though, let's be honest. Mearshart doesn't really get knocked out. I mean, he got knocked out. He's been knocked out three times, but it's hard to do it. Of course, Hamza, Hamza's the one that comes to mind. Ian Heinrich right before that, and then I think a long time ago before that. But 
if anyone's gonna do it, it's gonna be Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer's got a lot of power. He just does. You know, you see the right cross that he put on Amadovsky, the, the clean left hook that he wiped out Ozzy Diaz with. The guy's got a lot of power, and his striking's really precise, and it's really technical, right? And he's Pfeiffer picks his shots at good moments, and I think it's just gonna be interesting. But again, Mearshot's really good on the ground. If Mearshot catches him in a submission or something, or just catches him, catches him in a bad position on the ground, it will be tough for you know Pfeiffer to get out of it. So. I think it's a very evenly, you know, balanced matchup. I think again, it's the ground game versus of Mirashar versus the striking of Pfeiffer. I'm gonna take the striking of Pfeiffer though. I think Pfeiffer is gonna be able to land that big shot. He's younger, he's quicker. I just don't know if Mirashar's able to take him down. Pfeiffer is a guy. Takedown defense so far in the UFC, 50%. Got taken down um, once, I guess you're including the contender series. Got taken down by, by Dustin Stulfsis, but he was able to pop back up to his feet. So. I, I think, yeah, I'm, I think Joe Pfeiffer is going to be solid here. I think Pfeiffer is going to knock out Joe Mirashar. I think he'll win by first round KO. Okay, in the heavyweight division, we have got the Vanilla Gorilla, Chase Sherman, taking on Carl Williams. Um, Interesting fight to the point where Chase Sherman was supposed to be fighting Chris Barnett. It was a fight that we were all excited for because Chris Barnett, of course, is that guy in there. He's really fun to watch. Beast Boy is, you know, he's a very entertaining fighter, especially with the crowd involved. But... Barnett's got to pull out. Now we get Carl Williams versus Chase Sherman. Chase Sherman's a guy that is 4-10 in the UFC. The guy has not seen all that much success in the promotion. In his last, what, six fights, he's 1-5 in the UFC, and he's still fighting. Um, it's because he took he took on he took the Alexander Romanov fight. He took Romanov on a short notice. He was going to go do bare knuckle fighting. He fights Romanov, he loses, but he comes back. He's got a fight where if he wins, he probably stays in the UFC. If he loses, he's done. He beats Jared Vandera, finishes him in the third round. It loses, though, his fight after that to Waldo Cortez Acosta. And now probably in a fight where if he loses, he's done again. He gets Carl Williams. This is his third stint in the UFC for the Vanilla Gorilla. We'll see what happens with Carl Williams because, if anything, this is a better matchup for Sherman's opponent than what Chris Barnett was going to be. Because Chase Sherman's a boxer, he will offer it back to you. And I think, yes, I think Chris Barnett was still going to win, but I think that was a somewhat difficult fight for Barnett to the point where, okay, Sherman is still a good boxer. You see, like, you see what happened to Jared Vandera, right? I know Vandera wasn't great by any stretch of the imagination either, but Sherman does have hands. Like, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. Sherman might not be great anywhere, but, like, if anything, he's got solid striking and he can land a big shot if he needs to. And if he's just striking, he's got a decent gas tank. And if he's just striking with another guy who doesn't have a decent gas tank, okay, he can be a little bit dangerous. And that's exactly what the matchup with Chris Barnett was going to be, given that I still think Chris Barnett was going to be able to finish him. But I don't know. Again, Sherman's a guy who doesn't really get finished all that often by TKO. He's a guy that will get submitted, but he won't get finished early in the fight by knockout. That's really just not how Sherman fights goes. Like, Sherman fight goes. Like, the last fight that that happened in was the Shamil Abdur Kima fight, and that was only back in 2017. That was in Shanghai, China, right? So... Or is that in Beijing? I don't know. But Sherman gets Carl Williams here. If anything, this is just a tougher matchup for Chase Sherman. This is why Carl Williams is going to wrestle him. That's what Carl Williams does, right? I mean, that's that's what he does in all of his fights. Williams is not a guy who's going to go out there and get finishes all that often. He's a guy that's going to take you down. He's just going to hold you down. And that's exactly what happens to Chase Sherman a lot. Chase Sherman goes in there and he gets dominated on the ground. That's a point where guys, you know, have, you know, have beat him before. Jake Collier was able to see, you know, see very good success by submitting Chase Sherman on the ground. Alexander Romanov obviously did it very easily. Parker Porter even took down Chase Sherman. Carl Williams is going to take down Chase Sherman, and he's going to take him down at will, and he's going to keep him down. The only, the only thing that concerns me a little bit, a little bit, is, is the gas tank of Carl Williams. I don't know exactly where that's going to be at. His last fight was against Lucas Brezky. That was a month ago. So I don't think it's going to be that bad because he just fought. But yes, he's taking this on, what, seven seven days notice. It's not ideal. I still think Carl Williams is going to win. I think he's going to go in there. And I think, again, he is going to ground Chase Sherman and he is going to hold him down there. So give me Carl Williams by unanimous decision. But again, I'm not that confident to the point where I would like lay any money on this fight. But I think Williams is going to win. I think it's going to be takedowns. I think it's just going to be, again, positioning. I don't think he's going to get a finish. But I think he'll just hold Chase Sherman down. Carl Williams will be able to win this fight by unanimous decision. Our next fight is Michelle Watterson Gomez taking on Luana Pinheiro for M Michelle Watterson. Surprise, honestly, she's still fighting. She's still active because she has lost four of her last uh, five. Her only win being the Angela Hill win, which a lot of people thought she lost that fight. I still think Watterson won that one. It was a, you know, it was a main event. September 2020, Watterson wins it by unanimous decision. Or sorry, split decision. But her other losses. Last fight, she gets submitted by Lam Amanda Lemos in the second round by guillotine choke. 
Marina Rodriguez beats her by unanimous decision before that. She beats Angela Hill, loses to Carla Sparza by split decision, and then loses to Joanna Jonjacek by unanimous decision before that fight as well. It's just, Watterson hasn't looked great. I mean, yeah, the Lamos fight, honestly, she wasn't horrible in the first round. I think she outstrikes Lamos, and she probably wins that first round, but still, I, I just think that she's getting on that tail end of her career, and for Luana Pinheiro, she hasn't been, you know, absolutely dominant, obviously, but she has gone up there. She has won fights, but... Like, when you really look at it, though, like, honestly, Luana Pinheiro hasn't been the greatest. I actually, I, I feel like, I thought Luana, I, I don't know why I thought Luana Pinheiro actually had that Jessica Penne fight. She didn't. Um, she hasn't fought since 2021. She's only 2-0 oh in the UFC. She beats, she wins a fight in the Contender Series. She beats Random Marcos, but it's a fight that she gets a legal up kicked in, given she was winning the fight to that point. But still, you know, she wins by DQ, and then she beats Sam Hughes. Big deal. So honestly, when I look at this fight, there's a pathway to victory for Michelle Watterson. Watterson could outstrike Luana Pinheiro on this fight, and it wouldn't surprise me all that much, right? Because, you know, Pinheiro, given she is 29, she's, you know, the much younger fighter. She's probably quicker, but she's not going to be all that much bigger than Watterson, Watterson, a fighter who used to fight at 105 pounds. But honestly, when we look at this fight, this isn't that. I thought it was a little bit that, you know, oh, Pinheiro's going to win no matter what. But as I look into this fight, I think there's definitely a chance Gomez can win this one. Um, I just think, you know, maybe, you know, her kickboxing, I, I wouldn't really see Watterson going to the ground all that much in this fight, but like, when you, again, when you look back at Watterson's fight against Amanda Lemos, you see, okay, she was able to go out there, she was able to win the first round, if she's able to keep that going for three rounds, maybe she is able to go out there and beat Luana Pinheiro. Luana Pinheiro, again, 2-0 in the UFC, when you really look at her fights, not the most impressive, so that's why I do see Watterson at only a plus 140 in this fight, and as, again, as I look at this fight, I think I'm going to take Michelle Watterson to win. I'm going to take Watterson at plus 140 in this fight. I think Watterson will be able to go out there and win this fight by decision. Um, I, I think, again, I think if she's able to mix it up with the takedowns, that can be huge, even though I think Pinheiro is going to be the one looking for takedowns. But Watterson's takedown defense is not that bad. 67% takedown uh, defense rate so far in the UFC. Um, again, she was able to stuff a lot of takedowns from the future and former champion in Carlos Sparza when they fought in 2020. I think this is a fight that Michelle Watterson can get back on the winning track here. I think if she wins, she'll likely retire. If she loses, she'll likely retire. But I think it's a fight that Michelle Watterson Gomez wins. I think she outstrikes Luana Pinheiro and keeps this fight standing, giving Michelle Watterson a win by unanimous decision. So our next fight is at 185 pounds. We have got the action man, Chris Curtis, taking on Kelvin Gaslam. A fight that should honestly be on the main card. I know it is the last fight until the main card, but really, I know the UFC wants to push Raul Rosas Jr., but man, this fight should be on the main card. It is a good one. Gaslam and Chris Curtis, and for the action man, coming off of winning his last fight, finishing Joaquin Buckley in the second round. UFC 282, Blakovic on Goliath, a huge left cross, putting down Buckley and winning that fight in the second round. Before that, though, for the action man, losing to Jack Hermanson has only lost so far in the UFC. It was a fight, again, we talked about it. Curtis just really couldn't get going in that fight. Um, he felt like Hermanson was running a lot, but it was really just Jack Hermanson was out striking him, and Hermanson was able to stay out of uh, stay out of danger really in that fight. Before that, for Curtis, beats Adolfo Vieira, beats Brendan Allen, beats Phil Haas. All fights that he looks really good in. The, Cur the Adolfo Vieira fight, Curtis has to stuff like 19 takedowns. He does that to all of them. 20 takedowns, excuse me. Hodova Vieira goes over 20 his takedowns in that fight, and Chris Curtis is able to outstrike him throughout the entirety of that fight. The Brendan Allen fight, Curtis knocks him out in the second, and the Phil Haas fight, he knocks out Phil Haas in the first round after looking, you know, not looking great to start that fight, but Curtis comes back and finishes him at the end of that first round. That's just something with all Chris Curtis fights. Curtis is a slow starter. That's how he fights. Um, but so it wouldn't be it wouldn't surprise me if Kelvin Gaslam comes out to an early lead in this fight and Kelvin Gaslam wins maybe the first round, but then Curtis builds his way back and finishes him in the second or the third, or you know, wins those last two rounds. Because even the Chris Curtis fight against Joaquin Buckley, Buckley beats him in the first, and he's on his way, he's winning the second round until Curtis lands that big shot. And it's an excellent, um, it's an excellent left cross that uh Chris Curtis lands to sit, to sit down Buckley and win it. But when you look at his opponent here in Kelvin Gaslam, Gaslam is on a huge losing skid since beating Jacare Souza at UFC 224 to gain his shot at the world championship against Robert Whitaker, a fight that ended up getting canceled. Then he went, up, went on to fight Israel Adesanya for the interim championship. Kelvin Gaslam has lost five out of his last six fights, loses to Israel Adesanya, loses a fight to Darren Till, gets heel hooked submitted by Jack Hermanson, beats Ian Heinish, loses to Robert Whitaker, loses to Jared Cannonier, booked against Nasruddin Imava, fight doesn't happen, booked against Drikas Duplessis, fight doesn't happen, booked against Imava again, fight does not happen. The, the last Imava fight was supposed to be out on that card where Sean Strickland ended up fighting Nasruddin Imava. Of course, um, Strickland ends up winning that fight. That originally, though, was supposed to be Calvin Gaslam. Um, 
Gassum's a guy who doesn't get finished, though. Not really. I mean, not by knockout. So he's got a really good chin. You saw, you know, he was able to take all that from Adesanya, from Whitaker, from Cannoneer. So I don't think Curtis is going to be able to finish him. But I think this is a fight that where Chris Curtis is able to win this fight by decision. I think he's striking so much better than Gaslam. I think Gaslam, again, is at this point in his career where he's not one of these top guys. He's still 31 years old, but he's had so much wear and tear in the octagon. Given he has not fought in two years, it's been a while. It was a main event spot against Jared Cannonier and for Gaslam, he keeps fighting these tough guys. I feel like they need to give him another Ian Heinrich type of fight just to get him back, you know, with the win. So I don't think he's going to be cut from the UFC if he loses this fight just because he is Calvin Gaslam and he always puts on a really good show. And I think this will be a big, very good back and forth fight with him and Chris Curtis. But in the end, I think Curtis is the better striker. I think Curtis is going to find his big shots. I don't think Gaslam's able to take down um, Chris Curtis, especially since Gaslam hasn't been really looking for the takedowns all that much, uh, you know, in his last couple of fights, except for the Heinrich fight. And Chris Curtis, is, again, is a good defensive wrestler to the point where he's going to be able to keep Gaslam standing. So I think Chris Curtis wins, and Curtis wins by decision. Again, so starter is Chris Curtis, and Kelvin Gaslam's got a great chin. So I, think, I don't think Gaslam's going to be put away, but I also think Chris Curtis is able to just go in there and dominate Kelvin Gaslam um, on the feet after that first round because of Curtis's you know, tendency to start slow. So then Gaslam is going to um, win the first, and I think in the second and the third, Chris Curtis is going to win. Give me Chris Curtis to win this fight by unanimous decision. I think he's really going to run away with it after that first round. So give me the action man to win yet again, improving his UFC record to five and one. So opening up the main card, we have got Raul Rosas Jr. taking on Christian Rodriguez. For Raul Rosas Jr., of course, 18 years old in his second fight in the UFC. His first one was that win over Jay Perrin, where he goes in there and finishes Jay Perrin in the first round by a rear naked choke. Is the fight where Perrin was talking all sorts of crap to Raul Rosas before the fight. Of course, uh, Rosas goes in there and beats him and submits him in the first. But um, for Raul Rosas, his opponent will be Christian Rodriguez in this one. For Rodriguez, um, one and one in the UFC comes in. Loses to Jonathan Pierce in his first fight, but JSP is a very first, a very tough first fight in the UFC. Pierce goes in there, takes down Rodriguez, holds him down for about 12 minutes, and Pierce wins the fight by unanimous decision. In C Rod's second fight, he comes back though. He beats Josh Weems. It's a fight where he submits Weems by Anaconda choke in the first round. Um, you know, good win for Christian Rodriguez. And it's gonna offer something different for Raul Rosas. I think it will be Rosas' toughest fight to date. Cause before the contender series, let's not let's keep it real with each other. Like, let's keep it real. Rosas didn't really fight anyone before he got in the contender and the contender series is what really legitimized him honestly um what do you want by unanimous decision given again no one's gonna book anyone all that tough against a 17 year old or a 16 year old that was that what that's what rosas was before he got in the contender because again when he won the contender series the guy was 17 years old now he's you know 18 he beat jay perrin when he was 18 um, and now he get, gets Christian Rodriguez, a fighter who is relatively young in his career as well. He's relatively young in general. He's 25 years old, but yet he's got seven years on his opponent in Raul Rosas Jr. Um, it's, this fight's going to be interesting because, again, we saw how legit Raul Rosas is in his last couple fights. He's legit. And you saw he's able to go in there. He's able to get easy submission victories over guys like Jay Perrin, who give it. Jay Perrin was not the best UFC fighter at all, but still... He's a borderline UFC caliber guy that Rula Rosas was able to go in there and submit right away. And Christian Rodriguez is, not, is another borderline UFC level guy, but is better than Jay Perrin. He's been able to win a UFC fight and was able to win a, a, a UFC fight, excuse me, by submission as well. So if Raul Rosas Jr. is able to submit Christian Rodriguez, it is going to vary legitimize him it is like this guy is going to be legit if he can go out there and submit christian rodriguez i can see it happening 100 i just don't know because rodriguez is not bad on the ground either but you have seen the fight against jsp where jsp was able to just you know control him on the ground and hold him down there but you know how good jonathan pierce is in his own right and jonathan pierce was not able to submit a guy like christian rodriguez so that just shows you if raul, Rod raul rosas is able to submit christian rodriguez it's going to show you truly how good this guy is I don't think he's going to be able to get that sub, though. I think Rosas is going to win by decision. I think it's going to be back and forth. I think Rodriguez is going to put him in some tough spots, especially on the ground. I don't think it's going to be a gimme fight for Raul Rosas like that fight against Jay Perrin was, but I think he'll do just enough to win this fight. I'm going to say two rounds to one for Raul Rosas Jr. I think he wins it by unanimous decision. I think Rodriguez is going to win a round on him, but I think Rosas, again, is going to be good on the ground. I think he's going to 
I think he's going to control where this fight does end up. I think he's going to be in better positions against Christian Rodriguez. I think he's going to threaten a little bit with, with submissions in his own right. But give me the 18-year-old Raul Rosas Jr. to win this fight by unanimous decision, just controlling Christian Rodriguez on the ground. Great fight now at 170 pounds. It is trailblazer Kevin Holland taking on at Santiago Ponzinibbio. What a fight, man. This is a good one. This is a really good fight between these two guys because Kevin Holland coming off that war and one of the fights of the year in 2022. I don't feel like that fight gets talked about enough. The Kevin Holland Wonderboy Thompson fight's really good. Um, Holland wins by, or sorry, Holland loses. Uh, excuse me. Uh, Thompson wins by TK at the end of the fourth round. So of course, that fight where Holland can't get up off the stool because he broke his arm for good reason. I mean, he was probably going to get finished in that fifth round anyway, but I don't know. Maybe he wouldn't have. Holland fought that fight really well, though. Even in a loss, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson is a tough guy to hit because the new strategy on how to fight Wonder Boy is just take him down and hold him down because that's really the best way to do it. Now, that's not going to happen in Wonder Boy's next fight when he fights Michelle Panetta, but, you know, that's what Bilal Muhammad did. That's what, uh, that's what Gilbert Burns did because Wonder Boy is still very dangerous on the ground. Kevin Holland said, no, I'm going to go strike with this guy. And yes, he did take, he did attempt a couple takedowns, but that's not where Kevin Holland specializes in, so he could not get Wonder Boy down. But he went in there and he struck with Stephen Wonder Boy Thompson. He loses to Stephen Wonder Boy Thompson, but it's a really good back and forth fight. And Holland makes a really good account of himself in that main event spot in Orlando in December of 2022. Before that for Holland, though, uh, loses to Hamza Shemaev. It's a fight that he takes on two days notice because he was supposed to fight um, not Hamza Shemaev. He was supposed to fight Daniel Rodriguez. Fight doesn't happen. Fights Hamza instead. Hamza submits him in a round, obviously. I mean, what did you expect? Um, Holland beats Tim Means before that by Dar's Choke. Beats Alex Cowboy Oliveira before that. You know, Holland's still very good. And Holland's, you know, still 30 years old. He's a very good striker. This guy can go out there. He can go out there and finish fights. Ponzi Nebio has looked old, I'll be honest with you. Yes, he's coming off a win over Alex Morono in his last fight at UFC 282. Big uh, overhand right puts down Morono in the third round. It's a fight that he was on his way to win, likely, um, before that knockout. But still... Good win for Ponzi Nebio because he was coming off back-to-back -back losses to the likes of Michelle Pereira and Jeff Neal. Two fights that were split decisions and two fights that were very close. And both fights that, honestly, Ponzi Nebio should be able to make a case in winning, but loses both of them by split decisions. And before that, beats Miguel Baeza in his return. No, sorry, his return was the Li Jingliang fight where he gets knocked out. After that, he beats Miguel Baeza by unanimous decision. And everything before that for Ponzi Nebio is pre that three-year layoff that he took before fighting Li Jingliang. Um, Ponzi Nebio, though, still got the striking, obviously. Still got the power. Is 36 years old but he can still go out there and he can still strike and he can still throw out a volume obviously that you've seen in the Michelle Panetta fight 105 significant strikes the Jeff Neal fight 91 the Miguel Baez fight 121 right I mean he can still go out there and he can still strike um and he's still got power obviously look at the Alex Morona fight Morono he's able to put him away in the third round it's a fight that again he was looking good in before he gets the knockout Ponzinibbio can still throw. He can still definitely throw. He was supposed to get Robbie Lawler. Fight never happened. I thought Ponzinibbio was going to win that fight too. We, we were saying, all right, Ponzinibbio is washed, but he's not that washed. Maybe, honest to God, he's not that washed at all. But still, Kevin Holland's a very difficult fight for him because Holland's so fast. Holland's so long as a fighter. He uses his kicks effectively, uses his strikes, uses his reach advantage very effectively. It's just going to be a very tough matchup, I think, for Santiago Ponzinibbio, especially a 36-year-old Ponzinibbio, because that's just the, the style of fight Holland's going to bring. Holland's quick. He's going to talk to you. He's going to, you know, he's he's big mouth for a reason. Um, and against most guys, he would have, you know, if if it wasn't the, you know, the, the heart of Stephen Warnerboy Thompson, there's a lot of guys that Kevin Holland would have finished in his main event spot in Orlando last year. Didn't do it, obviously. But there's a lot of guys that would have wilted under that pressure and a lot of guys that would have wilted under the, the shots that Kevin Holland delivers. Of course, Wonder Boy's not that guy to wilt under that. But, you know, I still think I still think Holland's a very good fighter. I think Holland, you know, his striking's really good. His power's very good as well. And I think he's going to be able to go out there. I think he's going to finish Santiago Ponzinibbio. I mean, similar to what the leech Li Jingliang was able to do to Ponzinibbio, I think Holland's able to kind of replicate the same thing. He's able to go out there and he's able to fire right away and finish him. Um, I think it might take a round, though, so I'm going to say second round knockout finish for Trailblazer Kevin Holland in this one, but again, I see it pretty straightforward. I don't think Ponzinibbio is as fast as Holland is at this point. I don't think he's got as much power that Holland's got at this point. I think all around Kevin Holland's a better fighter, and if it does have to hit the ground, I think Holland's grappling has evolved, and it's gotten a lot better, as you've seen in that fight against Tim, Tim Means, where he's able to go out there and, and submit him with the Dars. I think Holland's gotten so much better all around. I think that Wonder Boy fight just proves it, even in a loss. And I think in this one, he's going to go out there and he's going to finish Santiago Ponzinibbio and he's going to get it done by second round knockout. All right, next up, we have got Rob Font taking on Adrian Yanez in this one. Yanez with another huge step in competition. I mean, this one is the one that's going to crack him into the top 10. 
this is interesting because Rob Font is still a very good fighter. Don't like let his fight against Cheeto Vera deceive you. Rob Font didn't fight that fight all that badly. He really didn't. I mean, 271 significant strikes from Rob Font in that fight. That is something that will usually 99 times out of 100 will win you a fight didn't happen in that fight. It's because of the Cheeto Vera fighting style, something that we did not get to see in the Corey Sandhagen fight, it's something that we were kind of waiting to see in the Corey Sandhagen fight, but didn't happen. It's where Rob Font, and you know, in the case of Corey Sandhagen, it's what happens in the first round with Rob Font and Marla Vera. Rob Font's dominating, he's, you know, he's, he's out striking him, he's using his jab, using his cross, he's winning that first round, he's not doing too much damage to Marlon Vera, but he's landing. He outlands him 57 to 26 in that first round. Okay, Second round comes, Rob Font outlands him 51 to 27, but he gets knocked down. Okay, third round, lands him, outlands him 71 to 37, but gets knocked down. Fourth round, outlands him 42 to 36, gets knocked down. Fifth round, outstrikes him 50 to 33, wins the round. I scored that fight 3-2 for Cheeto Vera. I, th I thought Rob Font won the fifth round, even though he looked like a mess in that fifth round. He was taking a beating, and every shot that Cheeto threw looked like he was doing a lot of damage. Well, Rob Font was doing damage too. It's just that it wasn't really showing on Cheeto's face like it was in Rob Font's right? So I think Font wins rounds one and five, two, three, four, though he loses, right? Because he gets knocked down every single round. That's what happens. And that's the Cheeto Vera effect. And that's what Marlon Cheeto Vera is going to do to you. I don't think Rob Font's all that bad. I mean, you look at the Jose Aldo fight. Okay. Well, Font goes five rounds against a guy like Jose Aldo. He loses pretty much every single one of them, but he's in the fight for 25 minutes. And Jose Aldo is still very good, even though I believe he just had a draw. Was it with Jeremy Stevens and bare knuckle, not bare knuckle, game bread, boxing, whatever league, Corey Masvidal's bare knuckle thing. I don't know. Or is it boxing? I don't even, I didn't, I don't watch. I don't know. Um, Font before that beats Cody Garbrandt in the main event, beats Marlon Modais, beats Ricky Simone, beats Sergio Pettis. Font's still very good. He's becoming more active, even though actually not really. It's going to be his third fight in three years. Um, but he gets Adrian Yanez in this one. And for Yanez, again, we talked about it. Huge step in competition. Like, absolutely huge. You look at the guys he's fighting. And again, Yanez has melted a lot of these guys. Brady Huang on the Contender Series. You know, San Francisco guy. Knocks him out in 40 seconds. Beats Victor Rodriguez in two minutes. Beats Gustavo Lopez in the third round. Knocks out Randy Costa in the second round. Has a split decision win over Davey Grant. And then beats Tony Kelly in the first round. And now he gets Rob Font. It is a huge jump from a guy like Tony Kelly, who the UFC is no, lo no longer has on their roster, which I think is a, really, a little bit ridiculous. I think he's two and two. They probably should keep Tony Kelly. Obviously, nobody likes Tony Kelly, but it, it makes for a little bit of, of an interesting fight. Don't get you, like, don't be mistaken yourself. I'm not a Tony Kelly fan by any stretch of the imagination, but just when Tony Kelly's on, you want to see him get knocked out. So, and if the guy's only two and two, why not keep him around? I don't understand that. I, I, I don't know. I thought they should have kept Tony Kelly at least around for another fight. Whatever. But yet you got guys like Chase Sherman, who's 4-10 in the UFC. Just saying. Yanez, though, from, going from Tony Kelly and Rob Font, it's a huge, huge difference. Because Font is still very good. We will see where Font is at, though, because he's not active. Because this is for his fight in a year, or 363 days since the Marlon Vera fight. Or actually, no, I got my math wrong. Anyways, it's going to be about a year. It's going to be like 11 months. Font's not all that active still, but he's still got really good striking. He's still got very good hands. He's still got very good volume. Giannis has got the power, but Giannis does, he can offer you a, you know, a volume type of fight style as well. The Davy Grant fight showed it, you know, but he's usually looking for a knockout. My thing with that is he's not going to knock out Rob Font. I don't care how much power Giannis has got. If Cheeto Vera wasn't able to knock out Rob Font, I don't think Adrian Giannis is going to be able to do it. Maybe, okay, who knows? Maybe, you know, it's different. It's a year later, who knows? But I just don't think Giannis is going to be able to get that finish against Rob Font. I think he's going to be able to beat him by decision, though, ever so slightly. I think this is going to win five the night. I think this is going to go three rounds. I think you're going to see maybe even a split decision in this one. It's going to be razor thin because Rob Font is still very good. But I think ever so slightly Giannis edges, gets the edge over him. I think ever so slightly. I think it's very tough. I think, again, right there. But I think Giannis is just, just able to do just enough in this fight. Again, you see a back and forth striking fight. Um... Again, don't didn't like don't doubt how good Rob Font still is. But I think Giannis is still very I think Giannis is getting there to his career. I think he's just making his way to the top ten. And this is the showcase fight for Adrian Yanez. If the Tony Kelly fight wasn't it, here it is on a main event against or, or, sorry, in a main card of a pay-per-view against Rob Font. Give me Adrian Yanez to do enough to win this fight. He'll get it done by unanimous decision. Actually, no. I never predict this, but give me Adrian Yanez by split decision. I just think it's gonna be that close. Again, it just depends. The judges are gonna be split. Give me again, Yanez by split decision. That's the pick. So, I mean, excuse me if this one's short, but I honestly, okay, I'll give away the prediction right now. How does Masvidal win? Like, he's, okay, because he's not going to be able to, he's going to have to do a, a Ben Askren type performance. Like, seriously, he's going to have to land a flying knee. 
Because if he doesn't do that, he's not winning this fight. Yes, Burns' chin is not great. That's something that does... That's something that, that is the one thing I can think of that really benefits Masvidal in this fight is that Gilbert Burns does not have a great chin. He did not have a great chin at lightweight. doesn't really have a good chin at welterweight either. That's the one thing that benefits Masvidal a lot. And But that is only if Burns cannot land a takedown. It, it's if Burns cannot get this fight down, then that is the little glimpse of hope Masvidal's got is, is that he can knock out Gilbert Burns. But you know how this fight's going to go. If Gilbert Burns is going to fight this fight just like he fought the Neil Magny fight. Takedown, submission, fight over. I, I don't... Uh, Burns isn't stupid. He's not going to strike with Masvidal. No one's going to strike with Masvidal at this point. Masvidal should be fighting guys. He should be on the Wonder Boy track right now, where he's fighting guys. And I know Michelle Panetta has been chasing him for five years, but he should be, honestly, Masvidal should be fighting Wonder Boy here. That's honestly the fight that should be made, right? He should be fighting strikers, but they still want to market him as a top guy, which they still can. This is the perception the UFC's got with Jorge Masvidal. They can, and by the way, first round submission, Gilbert Burns is the pick. I'm just going to go off a little bit by the UFC, and then I'm, I'll talk about why, but I feel like it's pretty obvious. But the UFC still still has this perception of Jorge Masvidal like he's a top star. He's not, okay? Maybe in terms of pay-per-view, he's still a big star, but in terms of the sport of MMA, he is not a big star. But the thing is, you can still market him as a big star. You just don't put him in his spot in his spots against guys who are still in the elite class of fighters in the UFC. Kamaru Usman and Colby Covington and Gilbert Burns are in the elite class at 170 pounds. Those are the top four guys. They, those are, sorry, those are three of the top five guys in the weight class. I would put Shavkar Rachmanov and Leon Edwards as the other two because now Hamzat Shemaev is a middleweight. Those are the top, well, those are the top five welts weights in the world. Jorge Masvidal does not have to be fighting the top five welterweights in the world, especially when he's never going to fight for a world championship ever again. And I found it really stupid that people still make the case that if Jorge Masvidal somehow beat, beats Gilbert Burns, which he's not going to, but if somehow Masvidal lands a big shot, if he pulls you know, a flying knee and knocks him out, he should get a title shot. No way, no how. How? Why would he get a title shot after winning one fight in his last four fights? And his wins Gilbert Burns and Nate Diaz and Ben Askren, those are his wins that he's got to a title shot. Like, given, is Colby Covington all that deserving of a title shot? No, he's not. But you know why they're doing that. Pay-per-view. Sure. But at least Colby Covington just won his last fight, and it was against a guy who they're arguing if he beats Gilbert Burns should get a title shot. Colby just beat Masvidal. Like, it's stupid. But again, Jorge's not winning this fight. He's not knocking out Gilbert Burns unless he beats him in the first 30 seconds. Because other than that, Burns is going to take him down, and Burns is going to submit game bread. Masvidal's not, you know, he's never been a great wrestler, but it, that's definitely been exposed in his last, you know, three fights. I know the second Usman fight, he just got knocked out, and that's that's to say, like, again, if Masvidal just gets Burns striking for 15 minutes, well, who's to say Burns won't knock him out either, like what Kamaru Usman did? I don't think Masvidal, in all fairness, is very good in this point of his career, but you can still market him as a big star. He just does not have to fight these top guys. There are welterweights that could have been in this co event spot, and given Masvidal has been kind of, and Burns has been wanting this Masvidal fight for a while, so that's why I understand this fight's happening, but there are guys in the top 15 that Jorge Masvidal can fight that aren't wrestlers that can offer him a very good fight. You get guys like... Okay, well, if they want to kill him, they can give him Jack Della Maddalena, which honestly, before they send Masvidal off the UFC, they'll probably give him Jack, Mata Jack Della Maddalena, probably in a co event in Australia. I wouldn't be surprised at that at all. But you got guys like Neil Magny he can fight. He can fight a guy like Vicente Luque. He can fight a guy like Helmut Michel Pereira. He can fight uh, Steve Warner by Thompson. He can fight Jeff Neal. He can fight these type of guys that, can, that, that are fights that Masvidal can win and guys who won't automatically wrestle him. But this is the fight where he's going to get automatically wrestled and he's going to get automatically submitted. Gilbert Burns is not losing this fight, guys. Gilbert Burns is winning. I don't know what else to say in terms of a fight, of talking about this fight stylistically, because Gilbert Burns is so much better on the ground. It's just a matter of how can he get that first takedown, because Burns is good jujitsu-wise. He's just got to find a way to get Masvidal to the ground. It shouldn't be that tough. I think he's going to be able to get a takedown or a trip or something. He'll work it in the clinch. He'll get Masvidal down. Give me, give me Gilbert Durinio Burns to beat Jorge Masvidal. He'll get it done pretty easily. First round sub victory for Durinio. Main event. Here we go. It is the rematch of their fight in New York last year, November of 2022. It is their fourth fight between kickboxing and in MMA. We've got the champion, Alex Pereira, taking on the challenge with the last style bender in Israel Adesanya. Okay, we talk about their first MMA fight. We don't really need to talk about the kickboxing fights anymore. They are not all that relevant. But we talk about the MMA fight, November 12th, 2022. What happens? Adesanya wins the first round. Izzy wins it. And I made the case, Izzy's probably up 4-0 going into the fifth round. That's honestly how I see that fight. 
I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'll be straight up honest with you. That's how that fight's going. Pereira probably doesn't win a round to the fifth because the first round, again, Izzy rocks him at the end of the first round. Um, it's very even until that point, and you can make the case Pereira's winning, but at the end of that first round, Izzy, boom, knocks him, wobbles him, and if he had two more seconds, he probably puts down Pereira. But okay, Izzy wins the first round. The second round, Adesanya wins it as well. I think it's close, but Izzy wins it. Pereira actually gets a takedown in that round, but I still think Izzy does just enough to win that second round. The third round, I think Adesanya wins too. He gets a takedown. He holds Pereira down the third round. Fourth round, more of the same. He doesn't take him down. And that's maybe the fight. Maybe that's the round where you can give Pereira. I maybe you think about giving Pereira that fourth. Sure. The fifth round, though, things something changes. Something changes. Pereira, he the entire fight, Pereira was setting Adesanya up to be backed up against the fence and he was waiting to just catch Adesanya in that spot where there's nowhere for Adesanya to go and Pereira's just gonna start unloading. And he waited to the fifth round to set that up and eventually in the fifth round, he got it. But that was a spot that always troubled me with Adesanya in that fight. I picked Adesanya to win that fight, but always in that fight when I was watching it, Izzy always gets stuck up against the fence and he's always in that spot where he's just gotta like duck and then like kinda shoot out and run away, which is something that he has to do against Pereira if he's gonna win but he always got caught up caught up against the fence and it was always tough for him in that spot. And eventually I was thinking to myself, watching that fight, I was like, eventually he's gonna get caught in that spot. I don't know how bad it's gonna be, but in that fifth round, Pereira catches him and Pereira kind of just unloads and Alex Pereira eventually with that one combination becomes a world champion. That's how good that guy is. He's, I mean, he's one, he's one of the greatest kickboxers of all time and that's what he's going to do to you in the octagon. He's, you know, again, Izzy can be great. Izzy's, Again, a tremendous champion, he's a great fighter, he's world class. And he was winning the fight up until that point in the fifth round, but that's what Pereira's gonna do to you. That's what he did in the kickboxing fight for where he, when he knocks him out, he's losing two rounds to nothing, but in the third round, boom, Pereira lands the big shot and puts him away. Like, that's just how Alex Pereira is, that's what Pereira's got against Adesanya so far. And it's just, I feel like it's really tough. Once you, once you lose to another man three times in a combat sport, it's tough to beat him a fourth time because what happens if Izzy wins here? They have to fight again, right? Because I know in MMA they're one and one, but in all they're three and one. So then they're gonna have to fight again. But I think Pereira's probably gonna beat him again. Honestly, I, I think Pereira's got it down now. I think that fifth round was huge. And I think, yes, Izzy might win some rounds early and Izzy might replicate what he did at the end of the first round. But I think if Pereira can just catch him and I think, I, again, Alex Pereira is only gonna get better with time in MMA. He's only gonna get more comfortable fighting in an octagon. I think, again, if Izzy tries to go with the wrestling, which I could definitely see, I think Pereira is gonna be good enough to the point where he can fight that off. I think, again, Pereira is now more developed in, in his MMA career where he's not gonna get taken down at will, which he really wasn't, but to the point where Izzy has him lost down there. Cause that was something that was a thing in the third round. Izzy takes him down, Pereira just kind of looks like, uh. What do I do? We're to the point where he's just waiting for the round to be over. That's, I don't think that's gonna be the case in this fight. He's had five more months of Glover Teixeira over there in Dansbury, Connecticut. He's had more time to train with Glover. I think that's gonna be, that's gonna pay huge for him. And I think Pereira is gonna be able, he's gonna know what to do at least a little bit better. And he's gonna be able to build a base and work back up to his feet. Um, but striking wise, I mean, you don't need to teach Alex Pereira striking, obviously. You don't need to teach this guy anything on the feet. This guy is very good. And I, I find it a little bit disrespectful that Poton's still the underdog in this fight. Plus 115 for Pereira is crazy. That is crazy to me. I get it. He's fighting Israel Adesanya. But man, I think Alex Pereira is going to win this fight. I think Pereira is going by third round knockout. I think it's going to be quicker this time. I think Adesanya is going to win the first round. I think, but I think Pereira is going to turn it around in the second. And the third round, again, I think Izzy's just going to get stuck in the corner again. I think Izzy's going to get stuck against the fence. And I think Pereira is just going to get in that spot and he's just going to unload and he's going to find a way to put him away. I don't know if it's going to be a TKO this time. I don't know if it's going to be a knockout this time. But I think Pereira simply has Adesanya's number. I don't know. It's, you know, whether it be with him finding a way to end the fight late in the fight or whether it be him you know winning by knockout early but it's been the way it's gone it's been Pereira finding a way to finish out Asanya late in the fight and especially in a fight that he's been losing I think this fight is different though I think in this one Alex Pereira doesn't need those five rounds I think Pereira gets it done in the first 15 I think Pereira is even going to win the second round and I think in the first round, I think in the first two rounds, I think Adesanya will look for takedowns because I think that is his best pathway to victory is by taking down Alex Pereira, fighting it safe and getting the world championship back. And again, Izzy's not a wrestler. He's not, but I think 
stylistically that something that favors him. That's just gonna be something if Pereira retains against Adesanya. You look at his next fight, well, who is it gonna be? I think it's gonna be Robert Whitaker. I think that's why Whitaker's not booked right at the moment. I think it's gonna be Robert Whitaker versus the winner if it's Alex Pereira. If it's Israel, then I think Israel fights Pereira again. But there's a reason, again, because Whitaker's fought all these guys. He's fought Cannoneer, he's fought Vittori. I mean, there's no one for him to fight. Probably Duplessis is the next guy, I think. I think Duplessis, if if Adesanya wins, I think Whitaker fights Duplessis even when he gets a title shot. Um, Vittori's always going to be there, but oh, I don't think Vittori beat Roman Dolidze, even though they gave him the decision. Obviously, Strickland's not going to fight Vittori because they, they fight at the same gym. Um, obviously, Roman Dolidze is going to be there as well in the mix. Derek Brunson, probably not because Duplessis just beat him. But yeah, I think, honestly, I think the title, the title picture circulates around the winner of this fight. If Izzy wins, he fights Pereira again. Whitaker would probably go fight Drigas Duplessis. And then if... Pereira wins Pereira probably fights Whitaker and then Duplessis probably aims for a guy like Jared Cannonier. Um and then I think maybe uh Strickland probably fights a guy like Romando Lidze and then probably Vittori gets stuck with I don't I don't know who Vittori gets stuck with Vittori probably gets stuck with a guy like Imavov I don't know or maybe even a Chris Curtis no same gym I don't know we'll see Anyways, um, in this fight, though, give me Alex Pereira. Give me the champion. Give me Poton to win by, by third-round knockout. I think he's better than Israel Adesanya striking-wise. Again, we've seen it three times. Who's to say it's not going to happen again? Alex Pereira is going to find a way, and he's going to knock out Israel Adesanya in the third round. Again, I think a, the big component in this fight for me is Izzy getting stuck up against the cage and Pereira just unleashing hell on him. And I think, again, Pereira's got it down this time. He's, he just saw it five months ago. The man's a psychopath. And he's going to do it again. Alex Pereira is going to retain the world championship by knocking out Israel Adesanya and finishing him in the third round. So, folks, thank you for watching our UFC 287 predictions here on the channel from Miami, Florida, this Saturday night on pay-per-view. Can't wait for this card. We'll be, we'll be back next week for UFC Fight Night Kansas City with Max Holloway and Arnold Allen in the main event. A huge featherweight fight over there. So, folks, thank you for watching. Make sure that subscribe button down below for more. Make sure you like if you are or if you did enjoy this UFC 287 predictions video. We'll, we'll be back tomorrow for PFL and make sure to comment as well if you do disagree with any of the picks. So, folks, thank you for watching. Make sure that subscribe button down below for more. And Mamba, Forever.